me learn the catechism, and um, I'm sure we memorized it because I knew it very, very well. And also for our confirmation, there were four in our class, and we had to stand before the, con the congregation on confirmation day and um, get questioned with all these questions, and we shook in our boots. So, but it was a good experience. So, were you you were you confirmed in the Lutheran Church or a different church? No, I was confirmed in the United Church of Christ in Latimer. Okay, and so you still had to learn the catechism, though. Yes, we sure did. We had that Lutheran catechism. I didn't grow up Lutheran. I didn't have to memorize that. I did not grow up Lutheran. Well, I was not raised Lutheran. I was actually raised uh, Catholic. And all my adult life, uh, I've been a member of the Presbyterian Church. I have worked in a Baptist church, and I've worked in a Methodist church. Uh, associate member here at the Lutheran Church, but never raised Lutheran. I didn't grow up Lutheran, so I didn't have to memorize it. I didn't grow up Lutheran, so I did not have to memorize a small catechism. I didn't grow up Lutheran. I didn't have to memorize anything. There is no practice within the Christian church which can be both as unifying and divisive as Holy Communion. Who can and who cannot come to the Lord's table continues to be debated in denominations and congregations around the world. Perhaps you have visited a church in which you were not welcome to commune and were excluded for one reason or another. Or maybe you were welcome to join with other Christians around this sacrament and it opened your eyes to a bigger picture of the body of Christ. This is nothing new. Out of concern that the sacrament be used in proper ways, church leaders have guarded against various abuses through the centuries. Sometimes this has resulted in overzealous restrictions which have further divided Christians, making the unity present in the body of Christ difficult to see. Coming out of the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was faced with continued superstition around the doctrine of Holy Communion. The doctrine of transubstantiation was formally accepted in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council. This doctrine stated that the bread and wine were changed into the actual flesh and blood of Christ, but remained to our senses as bread and wine. This change was believed to take place when the priest spoke the Latin words hoc est corpus meum, or this is my body. To the lesser educated lay people, it was seen as magic. In fact, the words hocus pocus, used by magicians today, is thought to have started as a play on the Latin words hoc est corpus. People began to sneak pieces of communion bread out of church to give to a sick farm animal, or to plant in their fields and gardens to ensure better crops. To combat this kind of abuse, priests began to withhold the elements from members of the congregation. Instead, they would eat and or drink the elements themselves on behalf of the whole congregation. For Martin Luther, all of the speculation on how the bread and wine actually are the body and blood of Jesus was a waste of time. Luther focused on the word est, or is. He said that the bread and wine is more than symbolic. Jesus is present in, with, and under the elements of the sacrament. He believed it to be a miracle that defies explanation. One need not understand how it works, but must simply believe and trust that Christ is present with the promise of forgiveness and eternal life. Because this is the true presence of Christ in bread and the wine, people wanted to know what they had to do to be worthy to receive this gift of God's grace and how often they should receive it. For many, it is unthinkable that we should enter into the presence of God in an unclean state. So confession and forgiveness was required before taking communion. Many people still remember going into the pastor's office in the days leading up to communion to confess and hear his absolution. Others will feel uncomfortable receiving communion 
unless the confession and forgiveness is done at the beginning of worship. This was not so for Luther. In the small catechism, he writes, A person who has faith in these words, given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, is really worthy and well prepared. In fact, our unworthiness is exactly what makes this sacrament a gift of God's grace, and that someone who believes themselves to be unworthy is, in fact, in the right frame of mind to receive it. Because of this, Luther believed that there is no reason to compel anyone to come to the sacrament. In the large catechism he writes, You may examine yourself in light of this commandment, and say to yourself, If I am a Christian at all, I should have at least a little longing, every once in a while, to do what my Lord wants me to do. These issues are still debated within Christ's church and within our congregations today, but for different reasons. Superstitious abuse of the sacrament is less of a concern these days than the issue of hospitality and the messages that are heard and felt when someone is excluded from the sacrament. And the frequency of Holy Communion has more to do these days with the practical aspects of preparing and cleaning, as well as with the length of worship. It may be that we never come to consensus on all the aspects of this sacrament. Fortunately for us, the gift of Christ's presence and of God's forgiveness are not dependent upon our ability to understand it or agree upon it. The gift comes to us as God gives us the faith to believe and to trust that it is so. This is most certainly true. <laughs>